I'm Mike Stern with another of my favorite passages from Dickens as part of the Dickens Universe's Dickens to Go series. This passage is from chapter 13 of Little Dorrit. It's a long one, so please bear with me. Mrs. Pornish's shop parlor had been decorated under her own eye and presented a little fiction in which Mrs. Pornish unspeakably rejoiced. This poetical heightening of the parlor consisted in the wall being painted to represent the exterior of a thatched cottage. The modest sunflower and hollyhock were depicted as flourishing with great luxuriance on this rustic dwelling, while a quantity of dense smoke issuing from the chimney indicated good cheer within, and also, perhaps, that it had not been lately swept. A faithful dog was represented as flying at the legs of the friendly visitor from the threshold, and a circular pigeon house enveloped in a cloud of pigeons arose from behind the garden paling. On the door, when it was shut, appeared the semblance of a brass plate presenting the inscription, Happy Cottage, T and M, Pornish. No poetry and no art ever charmed the imagination more than the union of the two in this counterfeit cottage charmed Mrs. Pornish. It was nothing to her that Pornish had a habit of leaning against it as he smoked his pipe after work. When his hat blotted out the pigeon house and all the pigeons, when his back swallowed up the dwelling, when his hands in his pockets uprooted the blooming garden and laid waste to the adjacent country. To Mrs. Pornish, it was still a most beautiful cottage, a most wonderful deception, and it made no difference that Mr. Pornish's eye was some inches above the level of the gable bedroom in the thatch. To come out into the shop after it was shut and hear her father sing a song inside this cottage was a perfect pastoral to Mrs. Pornish, the golden age revived. This passage has a deep personal meaning for me, as well as a literary critical one. Fifty years ago, I was in graduate school at the University of Cambridge, writing a thesis on Dickens and Stendhal. My late wife, a painter, was teaching art at the Workers' Educational Association and needed to get some special materials for one of her classes. There wasn't a good art supply store in Cambridge, and Barb discovered that the best one in all of England, Lawrence Art Supplies, was nearby in London, and in, of all places, Bleeding Heart Yard. I was so excited. Bleeding Heart Yard was real. We were going to visit an actual place that Dickens had seared into my imagination when I first read Little Dorrit. I still remember our first trip to Lawrence's. The shop was a block long, dimly lit, ramshackle, two-story labyrinth of counters, shelves, ladders, and cubby holes where quirks disappeared for seemingly endless stretches uh, before returning with exactly what you had asked for, no matter how arcane or rare it was. Um, I was in awe of treading where Dickens once had, in a place that seemed like a cross between Crick's rag and bottle shop, Mr. Venus's junk store, and the faded glories of the Pornish's domain. These days, Lawrence's has long since moved away, and the yard, while still there, has been modernized and gentrified beyond recognition. But I've never forgotten the frisson I felt of walking into the courtyard for the first time in 1971. I moved on from Cambridge to Yale to get a PhD in English. Uh, my dissertation was about models of society in classical sociology and 19th century fiction. It tried to uh, outline the struggle of political theorists and artists to understand and to represent the Industrial Revolution as it was happening. The passage from Little Dorrit became the centerpiece of my chapter on Dickens. It was the age of theory, but I was a throwback, a putative Marxist of Frankfurt School extraction rather than a deconstructionist, um, something of an outsider in the Yale English department. In any case, the Pornish's mural became my touchstone for the exhaustion of the romantic imagination and Dickens's resignation over capitalism's defeat of the emancipatory power of art. His fiction, like the little fiction of the mural, was a most wonderful deception, an opiate for the people. It merely covered up the brutal struggle for existence under capitalism, rather than holding out the promise of genuine happiness, per Stendhal and Adorno, and the possibility of imagining an alternative to the way we live now. I spent 100 pages or so um, recapitulating how the realist novel recorded the democratization of the once singular anguish of the romantic poets and their alienation from a debased, industrialized nature, and how that was transformed into the ordinary experience of death and life of the London masses, imprisoned in their literal and figural martial seas, whether Grosvenor Square or Bleeding Heart Yard. 
Mrs. Pornish's mural of a happy cottage was at best a cruel illusion, a retreat from the social action that might create authentic community, not a gesture of hope, and so on and so on. Um, it would have been hard to be more dogmatic or boring than that, um, as my ever grumpier thesis advisor didn't hesitate to tell me more than once, but I persisted in that vein for the relatively short duration of my academic career. Um, critics always pay special attention to depictions of art in fiction, since they can be read as keys to a novelist's own aesthetic theory. I like to think that I'm a bit wiser as well as older now. Um, as a Dickens University attendee in 2018, when we last tackled Little Dorrit, I was able to relish the sheer comic exuberance of the passage. It exemplifies Dickens as both the maker and a connoisseur of common pleasures and simple delights. He was the master of high and low, of comedy, melodrama, and tragic realism, all represented here. The passage now evokes for me not so much Adorno's aphoristic despair over commodified art's abjuration of its autonomy, but two other touchstones about the making of Dickens' art in Dickens' own work. One is the description of physician's practice in chapter 25 of Little Dorrit. Quote, few ways of life were hidden from physician. He went, like the rain, among the just and the unjust, doing all the good he could, or he was, something real was. That's surely an allegory of Dickens himself at work. The other is from chapter seven of Great Expectations, where Joe the blacksmith recites his little poem about his dead father to Pip. Quote, Joe recited the couplet with such manifest pride and careful perspicuity that I asked him if he had made it himself. I made it, said Joe, my own self. I made it in a moment. It was like striking out a horseshoe complete in a single blow. Long before Stephen Dedalus set out at the end of a portrait of the artist as a young man to forge in the smithy of his soul the uncreated conscience of his race, the fiery forge of Dickens's sovereign imagination struck out the inimitable journalism and fiction that still endures as the conscience of his time and of ours. Mm -hmm.